This interview is brought to you by First Majestic Silver Corp., one of the world's purest and fastest growing silver mining companies. Welcome back to Cambridge House Live. I'm Vanessa Collette here at the Canadian Investor Conference Vancouver, and I'm pleased to be joined by Fabrice Taylor, columnist with the Globe and Mail and publisher of the President's Club. Welcome, Fabrice. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Now, Fabrice, last fall uh, you stated that you were holding about 40% of your assets in cash. Is that still the case? I might be at 35, but that's, yeah, that's pretty close. I think that we're near the top of the market. I can't predict when that's going to be, obviously, but the bull market's gone on for six years now. They always come to an end. You don't know when they come to an end, but it's there's nothing worse than realizing that the market boom is over and you don't have any cash because everything <laughs> right. gets really cheap really fast. I've been there, so I never want to be there again. So I advise my subscribers to be raising cash, to kind of be in harvest mode. Take take some money off the table and harvest your gains and get rid of some of your losers. So you're taking profits at the moment? I am. I'm not doing a lot of new investing, a little bit here and there, but I'm more selective, more value oriented, not as much you know sort of growth. I'm avoiding you know private placements a little more than I used to. I want to be very liquid in case mm -hmm. the market does turn over. Now, how surprised are you that it just seems to keep going up? I mean, it's in its sixth year, and that's that's only happened a couple of times in the last 30 years. Yeah, and I think if you look at valuations, they are at that market peak kind of level now, and everyone points that out. That's not difficult. I think what's missing in this cycle is interest rates haven't gone up. And I think right. as long as they don't, the bull market will continue. But I think it's going to be choppy because everyone thinks like me that we must be close to the top and it's going to have to come down at some point. I think until interest rates start to go up and make bonds more attractive or other kinds of investment more attractive, the stock market will probably continue to do well, but in a volatile way. Now you've said that you expect interest rates to stay low um, for the foreseeable future. What, what do you think that'll do for stocks? Well, as I say, I think that will probably be good for them in the sense that there's nothing to compete with stocks. It makes dividend yields look more attractive. At 2 or 3% even, they're, they're better than GICs or bonds, which are yielding you know, 1%. Um, I, I also think that it's good for business because their borrowing costs remain low, so they can buy back more shares and, and make more acquisitions and lower their cost of capital. But again, I think you're looking at you know, some volatile trading just because things are expensive and people are getting worried. Right. Now you've said one of the biggest mistakes that investors make is being overly emotional. Um, what do you mean by that and how does one avoid that? Well, uh, you, you know, the expression don't fall in love with your stocks or fill in the blank or whatever. Don't fall in hate with them either. I mean, I love buying stocks when everyone says, I never want to hear that name again. I, I specialize in two things. One is very small companies with high growth, and the other is turnaround situations. And that's where I make most of my money. And I love turnarounds because you can take an old company that's been around for 50 years, and it can give you kind of new company tech-like growth and returns because it's turning around. And the reason you can get these great returns from old established companies that are easy to understand is because everyone says, I never want to hear that name again. I can't stand it. I lost so much money. Right. I don't want to be the guy saying that. I want to be the guy buying stock from him. Right. So that's one example of why you don't Contrarian want to. Approach. Yeah, that's falling in hate with your with your stocks. Mm -hmm. Same with falling in love. You know, some people they buy a stock, they love the idea, they've invested in it financially and emotionally, intellectually, and then when things go poorly, they can't bring themselves to sell because they're in love and they lose money. When things turn on you, admit it, realize it, act fast because it's better to lose a little bit than a lot. Right. Now you've also said that one of the biggest mistakes or other mistakes that investors make is being illiquid. Um, do you think that you should always hold cash? or 100%. What's the you should, not 100% cash, but 100% you should always have cash. And I would say probably a minimum of 10% because you never know when an opportunity is going to come along. And one of the reasons people aren't liquid is because, especially in the smaller cap range, you know, your job as an investor, I always tell people, is to generate cash, either buying dividend stocks or taking profits. You should always be doing this. The point of investing is not to brag about how much money you're making on paper at the club. It's not to feel good about your investments. It's to generate cash. And if you're in a small cap that doesn't pay dividends because it doesn't make enough money or doesn't make any money but it's done well, create your own dividend by selling some. And always have cash in your account for those rare opportunities that come along they're rare, but they're the ones that make you the most money. So you should always have the ability to pounce on something quickly. Right. 
Now, last fall, uh, you were pretty excited about graphite. Where does that stand now? I'm still very excited about graphite and graphene in particular. Okay. In fact, today I just met with a company that's created a graphene light bulb, which lasts for 50 years, costs oh, wow. $2 to manufacture, and the technology is actually out of the University of Manchester, which uh, employs the two scientists who won the Nobel Prize for their work in graphene. So I'm very excited about graphene. I think that civilization has always moved along with material. So we had the Stone Age, we had the Bronze Age, it was aluminum that let us fly, silicon brought on the computer, the, the chip, and I think graphene is the next quantum leap, and I'm very excited about it. And we are particularly excited about a company called Alabama Graphite, which I think is going to be in mine pretty soon. It has some interesting graphene plays as well. You've traditionally always focused on small caps. Um, is that where you're seeing the most opportunity right now? You know, I have a reputation for that because I'm known for it because I've had a lot of big winners. I've also had some losers. But, um, you know, I don't... The thing is, when you're successful in small caps, the market is on your side. The market has to be on your side. Otherwise, uh, you'll never do well no matter how good the idea is. If there's no one around to buy stock from you or to buy it after you buy it, then you're not going to make any money. So the market, you know, being where it is, I think you have to be a little bit more cautious, more selective. Uh, I love turnarounds, as I said. Um, I do also buy the odd large cap. I mean, I'm, I cover AIG, it's a $60 billion company. It's been a great investment for us. And I always caution people, don't just buy small caps. You know, you've got to have 80% right. of your portfolio minimum in, in more mature, more conservative things. But if you want to juice your returns, you, you can't avoid them in small caps because that's where the real money is. Do you go into the blue chips much, you know, with dividends or? You know, I do. I don't buy a lot of bank stocks, for example, because I'm a fairly sophisticated investor and I can do well enough in small micro to mid cap stocks. Um, but I would advise the average person that you know you should own some of those big bank stocks, the big dividend paying stocks, because you don't want to, you know, put all your eggs in one basket. You, and I've seen too many portfolios that are full of penny stocks. It doesn't right. work because they're brittle and they're dangerous. They can make you a lot of money, but there's a downside too. Diversification. Exactly. Um, and just as we wrap up, what's your take on holding precious metals over cash? You can't buy a stock or a loaf of bread with gold. Okay, so I would I wouldn't say you should have gold instead of cash. But I do believe in gold because I don't see how this weird experiment in quantitative easing ends without inflation. It's just impossible right. to me. I saw Buffett the other day saying that he thinks we're living in a world he doesn't understand because he thinks there should be a lot of inflation and it isn't there. And a lot of very smart people that I admire are saying the same thing. So I do like gold just as that, you know, that potential. Right, insurance. It's an insurance policy. I'm not saying it's gonna go up. I'm not saying it's gonna go down. I just like to have it so I always have a little bit. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming by today, Fabrice. My pleasure.